Hello, everybody. What is up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, your host here on Crimes Untold. And today is a uh, is an interesting one. The reason why I say that is because I started looking into one case and it branched into another. Today's case I will be covering is the New Bedford Highway killings. Uh, this happened in Massachusetts, and it is an unsolved and unidentified serial killer case. But first, let's talk about some some not-so-nice things. Not that the serial killer case is nice things. Anywho, I digress. So, throughout the week, I kind of write down some things that have happened, like news-wise, stuff like that. Yeah, um, I guess the most significant thing that happened this past week was that of the shooting that happened at a Jehovah's Witness uh, meeting hall in Hamburg. Uh, the man who committed this, he's only being named by Philip F. Um, he is believed to have acted alone in this shooting that transpired on this past Thursday. And there was seven people that included that of an unborn child that had been killed in this attack. They believe he acted alone and then he took his own life. He is described as a sports shooter, a 35-year-old sports shooter who indeed had a gun license. Um, and after he fled the first floor of this meeting hall to where he went, it is when he took his life. Now, what I find fascinating is that Germany has very strict gun control laws, and he was still able to pull this off. He had nine round, like, he had shot nine magazines of ammunition, and he had 20 more ammo, like, ammo, 20 more mags in his backpack. M mags is magazines. So he had 20 more magazines in his backpack, so he was pretty well prepared to do whatever it was he had intended to do. Uh, the other thing that I found fascinating is that there was actually a Roman amphitheater that was excavated. Uh, I'm looking down here because, you know, I jotted down some fun little jazz doodads. That's what I do throughout the week when things kind of transpire, things on the news happen. I'm just like, oh, hey, I'm going to write that down. Maybe I'll talk about it. Maybe I won't. Um, I have a few other things on here, but yeah, there was a Roman amphitheater that was excavated in, in Antigua or in Antigua. It's A T or. Atega. A-T-E-G-U-A. I've already butchered it like four times. So it was there, and it's dated to be from the 7th or 8th century before Christ, so, or B.C. It's only about 44 meters in diameter, and this is the smallest amphitheater from the like Roman world that we have found. So it's extremely tiny. I thought that was quite fascinating that they also found this. Um, also, if you're not on the East Coast, um, we just had our um, spring forward. So we're an hour ahead of time now. I know it. if you don't experience time change, you won't really understand it. Um, Realistically speaking, this should be about one, like quarter of two when I'm recording this, but it's actually quarter of three. Um, yeah, so weird. So everybody on the East Coast is really kind of fucked up when it comes to our time change. We love the fall because it's fall back, but spring forward, spring, the spring forward gives us more daylight. Uh, fall back is less daylight but we get an extra hour of sleep. Anyway, I digress. Let's uh, let's uh, jump into this case, shall we? So the New Bedford Hideaway Killer, their victim count is 9 to 11 plus. 9 to 11 plus. Now, I'm doing quotation marks because of the other case that I found. Very similar, very similar to this case. So... This time frame for the New Bedford Highway Killer is between March of 1988 to April of 1989 for the first 11 victims. And this is in and around the areas of New Bedford, Mass. Now, there's two of these victims that have never been found. They are still listed as missing. 
So be between all of these 11 victims, there is a total of 15 children between them. All of these women were young mothers or young to middle-aged mothers who had gone missing. They had either had a past of actively using drugs or have used drugs or have had a past with sex work or were current like currently working in sex work. And also at least six of these women knew each other. So there's a common correlation with a bunch of these women. There is one that never had done any sex work, but she does have a history of drug use. So this reign of terror really took New Bedford, like it took a toll on New Bedford and the surrounding areas because when these women were being found, when their remains were being found, it's not something that you would think would happen in the New Bedford area in Massachusetts. It's not something that's common. So the first victim was found in July in 1988, and the last known victim to be found for the New Bedford Highway killer was found on April 24th of 1989, and this was off of the I-95. I-195. So is some suspects, but in my mind, there is only really one person that I believe did this, which is what ties in the second case to this. But I will talk about all of these. So the two prime suspects that they have for this, for the New Bedford Highway Killer case, one is a rapist or um, who is known to be a rapist of prostitutes in the area. Um, who actually committed suicide. And the other one, unfortunately, is an attorney with friends in high places and had deep connections to several of the deceased women at the time, like, at the time of their deaths. There has been no convictions in this case and no convictions that have, like, made in connection to this case whatsoever. But there is a tie like I mentioned, to another set of unsolved murders that is a multi-state case that is eerily similar to this one. One by one, I'm going to briefly kind of talk about our victims, their names, ages, what victim number they are, where they were discovered, and kind of, kind of a little bit about them. But for, and I know a lot of people like to really get to know these victims, I'm just going to do a brief summation of them, talk about our suspects, and I also want to present to you the second case that I believe all of the all of these women, I believe it's one giant case. I don't think it's two. So, victim number one, Robin Lynn Rhodes. She was 29 years old, and she went by Bobby Lynn. Bobby Lynn was discovered on March 28th of 1989, and this was along the 140 in Freetown. Her body was on the southbound side and was discovered by a Connecticut State K-9 police in their cadaver dog. She did have a pass with drugs. She did have a pass with using heroin and cocaine, but she was never known to be involved with prostitution. Another fact about her is that she's actually friends or was friends with several of the other victims. Bobby Lynn was last seen in April of 1988 by her mother. So she was last seen in April of 1988, but she was discovered in March of 1989. So each of these victims, they were last seen in a certain time and then found a little bit after. So I do want you to know that Bobby Lynn was was known to hang around at some of the same like areas that some of the other victims were around. So victim two, victim seven, and victim 11. And she was also good friends with victim number nine, which is Mary Rose Santos. Bobby Lynn was identified in April of 1989. So just the month after she was, her remains were discovered, she was identified. Rochelle Clifford Dopperella was 28. She is victim number two. She was last seen in April of 1988, and her remains were found in a gravel pit in Dartmouth off of Reed Road, which is a common area that will be a theme within these first kind of 11 
victims. So she was found in the gravel pit off of Reed Road on the 10th of December of 1988. She, her body was partially clothed, and it was about two miles from the I-195. There were hunters on ATVs that were, the, they were just on their merry way, and they were the ones that made the gruesome discovery. It is believed that she was a witness in a weapons charge case that was against a man named Roger, Roger Swire, of which he had actually raped her. This would give him possible motive for her death, but there was nothing fully tangible to kind of put these together. Now, Rochelle was last seen by Nancy Pava, who is a person we will talk about, Nancy Pava's boyfriend, and he actually was cleared of her death, of Rochelle's death, and of the death of Nancy Pava. Rochelle also had two children. Victim number three was Deborah Lynn McConnell. Deborah Lynn McConnell was 25, and she went missing from New Bedford in May of 1988. She was last seen by her father after they buried her mother, and he was she was last seen at the cemetery. Her family began to worry about her when she strangely didn't call her daughter to wish her a happy 10th birthday. And unfortunately for her family, her nude body would be discovered by a Connecticut K-9 State Police unit off of Route 140 on the northbound side in Freetown. And this was on the 1st of December of 1988. She was found with a bra around her neck, which made them believe that she was strangled to death via ligature strangulation. She was identified in March of 1989. Deborah Medeiros, or victim number four, she was 30 at the time of her death. A motorist was just making a pit stop to urinate between 30 to 50 feet from Route 140, and this is around the Lakeville line, and it this is unfortunately where this motorist discovered the severely decomposed, partially nude body of Deborah Medeiros. I will say there is various different sources that list her as 30 and also list her as 29. Also, another common denominator between victim three and her, her bra was found around her neck, so they believe that she indeed was strangled to death. Police determined that her body had been there for quite some time. She had been reported missing by her family in May, so obviously she had been she had been there for some time. Was reported missing by her family in May in her last time of being seen, like tangibly being seen, was on May 27th of 1988. Her mother, Olivia, said that the last time she saw Deborah was before she left to go see her boyfriend in New Bedford in May. And apparently her and her boyfriend were supposed to go on a cruise, but that, but she never made it. And Russell Oliviera, which is her boyfriend, would go on to actually call Olivia, Deborah's mother, and ask where she was because he hadn't seen her in a few days. And Russell would also say the last time that he saw Deborah was when they had a fight and she just up and left. This would set a panic in Olivia. I mean, it would set a panic in me too if the last time my child was seen was when she left to see her boyfriend on May 27th and nobody could see her after that. Like, like, we're only 15 minutes into this, and I haven't even dented this case yet. All right, so Deborah Medeiros is actually the first victim that they found, which was in July of 1988. So she had possibly been, her body possibly had been there since May, or we'll say, like, May 28th of 1988 until July when they found her. And I also want you to know, these obviously these victims have been found out of order, so the, it's a it's a guesstimation basically of when when and who goes in which order. Deborah's body would be the third identified among five bodies that had been found so far across the 140 in southeastern Massachusetts. Now it is believed obviously that she was strangled to death, hence the bra around her neck. 
And at the time that she was discovered, it was released that she and two other victims had ties to the Weld Square district that was known for its avid prostitution and how readily available drugs were at the time. It is also known to the public by her mother's word that Deborah was known to police due to her drug use. So she had ties to Weld Square. It is quite possible that whoever did indeed kill Deborah Medeiros knew this area, knew exactly where to find her, knew exactly what she wanted, and an easy target, which is a common theme for serial killers and prostitutes. They find them as easy targets. Christina Montero was 19 and quite possibly our youngest victim, or is our youngest victim for the New Bedford Highway killer. 19 at the time, and she unfortunately is still missing, and she is victim number 10. So she was last seen in May of 1988 in New Bedford. She was engaged to a police officer who worked in Dartmouth at the time of her disappearance, and she also had a young child. Also, like many of the other victims, she was known to use both cocaine and heroin, and she has never been seen since late May 1988. It is my hope that she will be found or her remains will be found at one point in time, but at this time she is still listed as missing. Marilyn Roberts is our next victim. She was 34 at the last time she was seen alive, which was in late June of 1988. She, just like victim 10, Christina Montero, her her father would be, uh, they have close ties to police force. So Marilyn's father, was a retired police officer for New Bedford, and Christina was engaged to a police officer. So there's a tie to a public official, basically, if you will. And Marilyn grew up in an extremely supportive family that was really trying to help her with her addiction to heroin. She was very lucky with such a like great support system, which is another similarity with another victim that I will talk about in the second case that is involved with this one. So she was extremely lucky to have a family like this, but all that hope that her family had, unfortunately, would be lost after she was last seen. Mostly her family just kind of thought that she moved to the West Coast so she could live with another family member, but they also came to realize that she didn't keep in touch with anyone, which was completely not like her. It wasn't until December of 1988 that her family reported her missing, and her body would not be found. It is said that in 1998, her mother wished that they had a grave to visit, and they obviously don't know what happened, and they probably will never know what happened to Marilyn Roberts. She is still listed as missing, like Christina Montero. Victim number five, Nancy Lee Pava. She was 36 at the time of her death. Her body would be found by two men that were on a motorcycle ride, and her body was found on the Reed Road exit on the eastbound side of the I-195 in Dartmouth on July 30th of 1988. So she was a mother of two. She was last seen on July 7th of 1988. So her body was found relatively quick in regards to the time difference between all the other women when they were last seen and when they were found. And she was last seen walking out of Whisper's pub of New Bedford's South End. And this was after she had an argument with her boyfriend, Frankie Pina. Frankie Pina became a person of interest because she went missing, because she was found dead, and because of his ties in the community. So she was reported missing by Frankie prior to the discovery of her remains in her remains in Dartmouth. Those remains would be identified in December, so she was found in July, but she was be identified in December of 1988 that indeed they were Nancy Lee Pava. Her boyfriend was was questioned heavily in regards to her disappearance, and the peace the police wouldn't let up on him. Mostly due to the fact that he was a drug dealer in the area and he had very many run-ins with the law. It was also known that him and Nancy's relationship was not very good. They had quite the record of phone calls about domestic violence and drugs about their relationship to the police. And a lot of people, a lot of people knew that their relationship was not good. At the 
like around the time of her disappearance, Nancy was actually going to NA meetings or Narcotics Anonymous. If you don't want, don't know what NA means, that's what it means. She was going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings for her heroin addiction. So around the 30th anniversary of this case, Nancy's sister was interviewed and her sister spoke about the day that Nancy's body was found. She said that she was driving home or driving on the I-195 when she passed a medical examiner's van. And she just knew in the pit of her stomach that they found Nancy. She just knew. And when I watched this interview, it was with the WPRI News when I watched this, I just felt so bad for her sister because it's not something that you think somebody would have that intuition that your family member was found. It's, it's not, that's not something that somebody just automatically knows that, fuck, they found another body. That's my sister. They, they found her. They found Nancy. She also talked about how she used to walk in that same area of woods where her sister was found. And she did this so she could hopefully find the two other women that were missing or any of the other women that could possibly still be connected to this, but we don't know. I just thought, I thought that was something that I needed to reiterate to you, whoever is watching this, because it's some, that's not something that you hear about on a daily basis when it comes to true crime. That's not something that you hear someone say, that they're driving back from the pool on a hot day and you see a medical examiner's van on the side of the I-195 and you're like, fuck, that's my sister. They finally found her. We have answers. Deborah Greenlaw DeMello was victim number six. She was 35 around the last time she was seen on July 11th of 1988, and this was in New Bedford. When her remains were found, she was actually kind of concealed by trees. And her clothes were just kind of like thrown around in the trees too. So the, her, where her body was found was kind of weird. It wasn't just all her belongings. Oh no. The odd part about this is, is that she had some of Nancy Pava's belongings on her as well. On and near her. Is that odd to you? Because it's odd to me. Oh. So, that instantly right there connected them together. Not that all of these aren't already connected together, which the Boston FBI or the Ma Massachusetts um, Federal Police, yeah, Federal Bureau Investigative Police, they already put all these together. They already knew that each time they were going to find somebody in this time frame, they knew they were related. Sorry not to get off on a tangent, but so just how odd that... They found the, a previous victim's stuff, which they were found relatively around the same time. So Deborah was found on July 11th, or last seen on July 11th, but her body was found on November 8th, 1988. The same exact exit that Nancy Pava was found, the Reed Road exit. So we have November, and Nancy was found in July. So we have, what, five months? Five short months that one was, well, actually it'd be like four, like four months where there's a difference in time where our previous victim was found in the same area as the one we just found. And belongings from our previous victim are found on her. Sketchy, super sketchy. And like I mentioned, found on the Reed Road exit off of the I-195 in Dartmouth. Same exit. Deborah was found by a highway crew working that area as well. So it's people, it's people on the highway that were working that area. They knew this area. So that's another thought. If it's somebody that's a, like in a crew working that knows this area, wouldn't, wouldn't somebody put two and two together that there could be somebody, whoever's doing this is somebody that knows these roads really well? I digress. So I want you to know as well is that Deborah was actually, she had just been recently a part of a work release program that was through the prison that she was kind of released from. She was on a work release through in Rhode Island. So she had been in this work release program 
from being released from the prison on prostitution charges. And the last day she was seen at this work release program was when she actually just escaped from it. She walked away, and this was on June 18th of 1988. Deborah was also the mother of three children. So the other com- the other common denominator, like I already mentioned, is that most of these most of these victims are mothers and younger mothers. So victim number seven is Mary Rose Santos. She was 26 when she was last seen on July 16th of 1988. And so she was last seen at the old quarter deck lounge during the early morning hours on July 16th. So her husband actually dropped her off earlier that evening. So technically it would be on July 15th. He had dropped her off earlier that evening in downtown. And it was known that she was going to walk to a friend's place that was close by. And after that is when she went missing. So when they found her body, there was also a beer bottle found with it. Evidence? You think, you know, hopefully it's a part of this giant stack of evidence that they have that's sitting in a storage unit or storage facility. Hopefully this beer bottle is is somewhere within there because if not, I would scream. I would internally scream. She, Mary Rose Santos was the mother of two children, and unfortunately, she was addicted to heroin around the time that she had transpired. She was friends with Nancy Pava and Rochelle Clifford Dopperella. And around the time of her initial disappearance, she and her husband had just reconciled, and they were planning on renewing their vows. It was public knowledge after after she was found that they they released that just before she went missing, she went to go find a wedding dress for her vow renewal ceremony. And she unfortunately lost her life life before she could renew her vows with the love of her life. Sandra Botello was 24, and she was a young mother of two sons. They were very young. They were four and six. Sandra was known to work the streets, prostitution, and she was also known as an ad, an avid user of drugs. Her body, unfortunately, would be found along the I-195 in April, April 24th of 1989. So she is the last body to have been found out of this set of women. And her body was found by a state highway crew. She was last seen alive on August 11th of 1988 when she was leaving her apartment. So she was leaving her apartment to go work. And that was the last time she was seen alive. Don Mendez was 25, and she was a mother of a five-year-old boy and also was known to have a history of drug reuse and be involved in sex work. So she was last seen walking from her apartment in the south end of New Bedford on September 4th of 1988. This is so she could attend a christening party, like a family christening party. Her body, unfortunately, would be found by a canine search dog off of the I-195, which was found on the westbound part of the I-195 that's off of the Reed Road off-ramp. And this was on November 29th of 1988. So there's a few suspects in this case. Just just a few. Just, just a few. Our first one is Anthony DeGrazia. Um, at one point, he was considered prime suspect number one due to his connection to the New Bedford Highway killings. So he was known to sex workers in the area because it is thought that he had beaten and raped some of them. He also had a very distinct flat nose of which he would be identified with. So he was arrested on 17 charges of rape and assault, and that happened in the Weld Street area, which is an area that I previously talked about. So Anthony de Grazia had spent 13 months in jail after his bond was set uh, due to him not being able to make his bail. So he just had to kind of rot in there. So during this time, he would appear in court a total of 18 times and while he was sitting in county jail. All of these court appearances were in regards to the habeas corpus and all the different motions that his defense attorneys presented. So on June 27th of 1990, he would be released on bail, but ultimately he would be rearrested due to him threatening the DA at the time. <laughs> uh, De Grazia felt that he was being wrongfully imprisoned and wrongfully prosecuted on charges that he didn't commit. What a likely story, right? What a likely story. 
Well, <laughs> so following his release, he was rearrested again. He posted bond and then was released again. I know what a lovely little thing he's got going on. Anywho, um, but this last time he would be released would be unfortunately his last time that he would be in custody. So it's during this time he would try and resume a normal life, but it would be anything but normal. He would be found dead in the backyard of his ex-girlfriend's house in Freetown. He was found face down under the picnic table. His death would be deemed a homicide when investigators arrived on the scene. But his death would be ruled suicide later, and this was determined by the district attorney's office. It is thought that he took his own life because he was named as the number one suspect in this case for the New Bedford Highway killings. We will never know of his guilt or of his non-guilt in this case due to his demise. Suspect number two is Kenneth Pont, or Kenneth Ponte, but I think it's Kenneth Pont. So he actually was indicted in August of 1990 for the murder of Rochelle Clifford Dopperella. She was beaten to death, which is something that I didn't previously discuss. I did say that she was beaten, but not that she was beaten to death. So Pont was an attorney that had quite a checkered past that included Dabarella and who is the woman that he was accused of, accused of killing. He is also known for his extremely sketchy career as an attorney, specifically for his extracurricular activities. If you don't know what I mean by that, he was an avid drug user. Fun. <laughs> Very fun. So Rochelle's mom actually gave a statement in which that Rochelle told her to call Pont if she needed to be contacted or represented Rochelle in 1988. Well, April of 1988. And this is when she basically had accused a man of rape and then she just went missing. So Pont, I mean, you're representing this girl and then she goes missing uh, kind of fishy, like, what's going on? What couldn't get any more odd of this is five months after she went missing, he moves. He moves to Port Ritchie, Florida, and this is in September of 1988. She stepped out of nowhere. He then would be arraigned in 1990 for the murder charges, but these charges were dropped due to lack of evidence, hence why it was a back and forth. <sighs> yes, just like Anthony de Grazia, back and forth. Because there's no tangible evidence, there's no way to keep them in jail. There's no way to keep them attached to this case because there's nothing to tie them to it. Anywho, so after the charges were dropped, he wouldn't stay out of the news for long. Oh no. So I say for long, but really it's about 19 years. So 19 years later, in May of 2009, the driveway and patio of his former home in New Bedford were dug up. They thought they were going to find something that connected him to the New Bedford killings, but they didn't find anything. They were unable to find a link that would connect him to this case, but a few days, so, like, they couldn't find anything. A few days after this, he was arrested for shoplifting. <laughs> uh, he was found with four cans of sardines and a block of cheese that he, sold, he stole from the Price Right in New Bedford. I know, so fun. What a life of an attorney. Our next one is Daniel Tavares Jr. He, so, he's kind of weird. Um, Daniel Tavares was actually, he wrote a letter claiming that he was responsible for all the killings in the New Bedford um, highway killing case. And he wrote this letter and sent it to one of the staff at the prison. And he actually wrote this while he was incarcerated for the murder of his mother. Fun, right? So it's no, it's it's not bullshit that he's actually a convicted murderer because you know he's already been convicted of one murder. Why not just Henry Lee Lucas myself and admit guilt to you know nine other ones? So in this letter, he also wrote about the knowledge he had about an additional murder of Gail Botello. So, Gail Patello, her body, she was murdered. She went missing in 1988, which fits in the same timeline as a New Bedford highway killer. So, she went missing in 1988, and Daniel Tavares Jr. 
mentioned that she was murdered and that the place where her body was residing was under a tree in his backyard. Yeah. That her murder took place less than a mile away from his home and that she she was buried in his backyard. So with this admission of guilt, they took it and searched the area and sure shit, she was found buried under a tree. Now, he still remains on a, li a list of being a suspected perpetrator for this case. Uh, and this is mostly due to his rap sheet of already having four murder charges. So I already talked about Gail and his mom, but that's not it. So clearly the act of murder is something that he knew quite well because he was, you know, convicted of the murder of his mother. He then would be convicted of uh, that of Gail Botello. But he was also convicted of the murder of Brian and Bev Mwok. So, yeah, that's Daniel Tavares. So he's, he's clear up there. I'm not so sure about him because if he's just the killer for the New Bedford Highway killings, then the second strand string of killings may not be connected. But our next perp is the Lisbon Ripper. Now, the only reason why I'm mentioning this is because investigators for the Lisbon Ripper case came to Massachusetts because of the New Bedford Highway killings. And they did this because they believed they were the same person. They believed the Lisbon Ripper was a New Bedford Highway killer. I don't believe that is the same thing because, I mean, timelines similar, killed around highways, but two different countries? And how was he taking all of these women so quick, killing them, dumping them, and then jumping country to country? I just, it, for me, my brain doesn't fathom this. It can't, it can't, like, no, I can't, I can't fully understand it. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Our next person really makes sense for me. So, Alex Sensi. So, in March of 2007, Alex Sensi was accused of sodomy, rape, and an attempted smothering of a woman that happened in Boylston, Mass. So, this would end up tying him to something else. DNA from him would be taken, or DNA would be taken from the case that he was accused of in Boylston. And basically what happened is that the DNA that was taken was stored in a databank, and it would be run. So, this DNA would come back with a hit. And this hit was on the murder of Teresa Stone. So, on the 23rd of October of 1996, Teresa Stone was found dead, and when she was found dead, she was found partially nude off of Kinsman Road in Fitchburg. I know Fitchburg, I mean, still in Massachusetts, she was partially nude. We have some correlations to the New Bedford Highway killing. But as I go more into him and what he could be potentially connected to, things might make more sense. Teresa's cause of death was that of ligature strangulation, which is something else that would connect him to the New Bedford Highway killings, because some of them were found with a bra around their neck. Ligature strangulation. So, with the DNA from Teresa Stone's case, it then would connect to Alex Sensi and the attempted smothering and sodomy and rape of this woman in Boylston. Alex Sensi then would be convicted and found guilty for the murder of Teresa Stone. He would be acquitted on the charges of the rape, but the murder charge came quickly after the, after the acquittal. So Alex Sensi was deemed a person of interest in the connection to the New Bedford Highway killings, and this was in March of 2015. This is where this correlation with another case comes in handy to the New Bedford Highway killings. When I looked up this case... I found one video, one video about this, and the person that covered it, another smaller channel, had put two and two together, which I find very funny. I'm another small true crime channel, so here we go. Alex Sensi is also a suspected person of interest in connection with the Maine South Woodsman case. So the Maine South Woodsman case is another string of killings of prostitutes from Worcester all the way to um, the bodies would be found in Marlborough, Hudson, York, Maine, and in Rutland, Mass. 
so mainly in Massachusetts, but one was found in Maine. These bodies were found in between 2003 and 2007. Now, when I did the math, Alex Sensi in 1988 would be about 19 years old, which makes this fit. And I know this is like, man, it's him, man, it's him. But in my mind, it makes sense. As I talk about these women, it makes more sense. So the Maine South Woodsman case is a case of five women. And they were found murdered between, I said 2003, but it's actually 2002. So 2002 to 2007. So these cases of the New Bedford Highway killings in the Maine South Woodsman case are very similar. It's because these victims were either prostitutes or known a frequent area as prostitutes with prior drug issues. They were quick targets, and unfortunately, most of them would go unnoticed. And like I spoke about previously with the previous 11 victims, most of them, except for Nancy, uh, Nancy Pava, most of them went missing for a while before their bodies were found, unfortunately. Unfortunately, and there is a common denominator between most of them. They were mothers. Looks were very similar. Their background with prostitution or sex work or supposed background with prostitution and sex work and a history with drug use. And in the area that they were, they were found. They were all found near New Bedford. Some found near the Reed Road um, exit off of the I-195. All found around highways very similar to the Maine South Woodsman case. Obviously, one giant case with a lesser known case. Kind of suspicious, kind of not. So like the case of the New Bedford Highway killings, the killer of these five women is believed to have an extensive history of violence against women. But with this case, it's determined that it was a work of a serial killer due to a company called Stock. And they put together a profile which I'll kind of mention what stock means in a second. So they put together this profile of this man, and it was determined that it was a serial killer because the women have a Spanish look, their size was similar, their profession was prostitution, and it was literally the same for all of these women. They were mothers, their history of drug use. It's literally all the same common denominators as the New Bedford Highway killings, but with the Maine South Woodsman case. Very similar. Do you see how this correlation is the same? I know I'm beating a dead horse with a stick right now, but for me, my brain thinks it's the same. And it's Alex Sensi, when he became the prime suspect, he was eyed even more because of his connection to the area around the Hillside School in Marlboro, which is where two of our victims would be found. His connection, connection to this area is because he lived at 217 Robin Hill Street in Marlboro, Mass., which is a property that's owned by the Hillside School, which is where his father ran a campus farm. Very strange, right? Well, our two victims, our first two victims that were found, Betsy Montalvo, or Betsida Montalvo, which is her name, but she went by Betsy, and Carmen Rudy, their remains were found on this property. Hence why he's tied to it. So before I get into them, the place stock or is called a system to apprehend lethal killers. They did an extensive profile on, on the Maine South Woodsman case and they released it on September 10th of 2007. And this profile was extremely detailed to the point that they believe the person of interest in this case, that's the killer, is a blue-collar worker. They were either a truck driver or a construction worker. They were most likely between the ages of 28 to 41 in 2007, which Alex Sensi was 38 at the time. His home life as a child was extremely abusive. That was both physical and sexual and that he harbored hatred towards women, which was driven by the extreme hatred he carried for his own mother. And it's due to this, he most, most likely felt inept or inadequate stemming from this abuse, which, oddly enough, wouldn't make his desire less than in a sexual way. He would be very adventurous when it came to his sexual appetite, and he would often pay for services from prostitutes, of which said acts most likely were 
taken place in woods or heavily wooded areas, which is where he felt the most comfortable was in the outdoors. He also either drove an SUV or a truck, which would fit his outdoorsy vibes. And it's presumed that he most likely had quite the criminal history, stemming from being a peeping Tom to animal cruelty that escalated to the point of murder. All of these women, like I had previously mentioned, for the Maine South Woodsman case were sex workers in Worcester. They were known to be battling drug addictions. They had a petite build. They had dark hair, dark eyes, and need I say more of how more they were related to one another? So Betsy Montalvo was 29 and she was a mother of five. She was reported missing in Worcester in April of 2003. So Betsy and victim two, which is Carmen Rudy, actually grew up together. So they grew up together in the same housing complex in Worcester, and they were known to spend quite a bit of time together. They were childhood friends. They really, they really knew each other. And it's kind of hard to separate these two because these remains were found together. Their remains were found near each other. So Carmen Rudy, mother of two, she was found near, her body was found near Betsy. She had gone missing in September, well, on September 30th of 2002, hence why the span of crimes is 2002 to 2007, but their bodies were found 2003 to 2007. Carmen, when she went missing on September 30th of 2002, her family wouldn't get an answer for about a year after she went missing. This is because her remains and the remains of Betsy were found on September 24th, 2003 and September 29th, 2003 in a swamp land area behind the Hillside School in Marlboro, Mass. And that lovely, lovely property that I previously mentioned that Alex Sensi has a connection to. They were found by a group of children that went, that were from the school that started working on a project for self-sustaining farmlands. And they went to look in the overgrown woods behind the school. And some of the kids were, you know, roughhousing horseplay like kids do. Well, one of them picked up something, which at first they thought was a stick, but closer look, they realized it was a bone. So the bones at first were thought to be that, uh, like remnants of something a coyote ate. Obviously, this wasn't the case. The children then notified people that worked at the school. The faculty then would call the police the next day. So within the first few days after the debris of bone would be discovered, it was determined that this belonged to a woman. This woman was around five feet in height and was between the ages of 19 to 40. Her teeth were in a poor state. Of condition. This coincides with the thought that she either was a runaway or possibly homeless. Due to her lifestyle, nine times out of ten, she probably obviously didn't have a lot to maintain certain health. So dental health is one of those things that if fortunately, if, if unfortunately, if you don't have a lot of money, you're not going to focus on your teeth. That and if you are an avid drug user, your teeth kind of go with the use that you have for drugs. Not dogging anybody with drug use or that are homeless, but that's just something that is known. They also found a fully intact part of her remains, which was her skull and her spine. And these parts were actually found three quarters of a mile behind the school that was about 200 yards away from the I-290. Part of her was over here, and the rest of her remains were actually kind of scattered over a 50-yard area. So her body was kind of like all over the place, or this set of the remains was all over the place. So this is Jane Doe number one. They dub her Jane Doe number one. So I want you to know, too, this area was would be a difficult place to dump a body if you didn't know how to get through it. And the police determine that because it was very hard for them to get these remains out. It took them a few days to get these remains out. So just six short days after the discovery of Jane Doe number one, a second set of remains, Jane Doe number two, would be found 100 yards away from her from Jane Doe number one's remains. So this was also a woman. She was estimated to be about five feet to five four in height between the ages of 30 and 45. And it is believed that she was dead anywhere between three months to five five years prior to her being found, which kind of goes similar to the timeline of when Carmen Rudy was last seen. 
So these two sets of remains, like I mentioned, were quickly dubbed Jane Doe 1 and Jane Doe 2, but they would be identified. So Jane Doe 2 would be identified, thankfully, with the help of her sister Jackie. Jackie reached out to the police after hearing about the discovery of the remains, and she handed over Carmen's dental records to confirm whether or not it was her, and she would be identified on October 1st of 2003. Jane Doe number 1 would be identified as Betsy Montalvo, and she would be identified in March of 2004 after her remains were sent to the Smithsonian in Washington for identification. Danelia Torres was found along the I-290, and this was near uh, Brigham Street in Hudson, Mass. This was on March 3rd of 2004. So a contractor found her remains on the side of Brigham Street in Hudson, and this is close to the 290 and 495. Uh, 495 is a very heavily trafficked route, so a lot of people in Massachusetts know exactly where the 495 is. I lived off of it for a long time, so I know exactly where 495 is, especially in Hudson. So these remains were skeletal, just like the previous two, but... Something noticeably was different about this. Her skull was partially separated from the rest of her remains. And this helped the police think that, well, if the skull is partially separated, could she have been strangled? When you strangle somebody so hard in whatever whatever ligature is around their neck, it will break your break your neck. It will sever sever your bones to a point where, or not like fully sever, but it will detach them and make it look like they're fully broken off. How were the previous victims of the New Bedford Highway killings killed? Like it's your strangulation. She also was found with a shirt on her remains as well. This was a gray and white t-shirt, which was something they hadn't found with the previous two. So just one day following the discovery, these remains would be identified as Danelia Torres or Dinny as she went or she was known by from those around her. She was always known to light up a room. She was always known to be the light of the party. She always knew how to make people smile, especially when she walked into a room. She was the mother of three and she was also a hairdresser. But she also was known to work in construction to make ends meet. The last time she was seen was in Framingham, Mass., and this was in August of 2003, after she had started her downward spiral of her heroin addiction. She was reported missing on November 1st of 2003 by a relative. So it's after the discovery of Danelia's body when investigators believed that this was a work of a serial killer in the area. And this was because a serial killer, like, they weren't expecting to have a serial killer operating in their backyard especially the backyard of locals, just like that of the New Bedford Highway Killer, had previously done in 1988 and 1989. It is thought that nobody could unsee the uncanny resemblance of these women, and that is completely unsuspecting. For women that are so closely, like, their resemblance is so close, that it's something that nobody expected, that they were just being taken from the streets and, and killed. Just like Betsy and Carmen, Carmen and Danelia, or Carmen and Denny, were very similar. They had similar issues, such as stints in the same treatment centers in 1999. They both were teen moms that dropped out of high school. They were extremely close to their families, and even the fact that their children's fathers abandoned them while leaving them as single mothers. That is completely uncanny how close these women seem to be. Their backgrounds are extremely similar. And also the resemblance between the two of them is completely uncanny and horrifying. When the public heard of the parallel between these two women, they were terrified. This then prompted Boston's FBI to take the services that the nation's center for analysis and violent crimes in Quantico for help. They finally were like, I need your help. Something is wrong and the public is genuinely terrified because of this. Wendy A. Morello would be found in York, Maine. And this was on September 13th of 2004. So Wendy is our only victim that is known to be found in Maine. That we know of, there could possibly be more victims we just don't know about that haven't been found yet. There's always that chance. Wendy was a struggling, 
she struggled throughout her adult years with her opioid addiction. She suffered from relapse and sobriety, and it would come and go, but her addiction would always still prevail. Wendy was last seen by her family around September 1st, but it is known that she was last physically seen on September 5th when she was staying at a friend's apartment. So she would up and leave and flee from this apartment at around 4 a.m. And it's presumed she got into a vehicle after she left this apartment. I do want you to know that she was known the last few days that she was seen alive. She was known to be heavily into her drug addiction, and she was awake for several days, and she was hallucinating due to this drug-induced state that she was in. Which makes me think that it wasn't, like, that she was on meth, because, frankly speaking, if you're on meth, you're up for days, and you are in a drug-induced psychosis, and hallucinations start. So I'm wondering if she was addicted to methamphetamine. On September 13th of 2004, Wendy's daughter reported her missing. This same day is the day that a man walking along Riverwood Drive would find human remains in a bag inside of a 35-gallon trash bin. This was just four days after the discovery of this set of remains, it was determined that this was 42-year-old Wendy Morello. It is believed that Wendy was killed elsewhere and her body was dumped in this trash bin. This can be semi-corroborated because the shirt she was found in was a white, like, prep sh cook shirt. It was not the same black shirt she was last seen in when she fleed from her friend's apartment. This also indicates that she was somewhere else for an unknown amount of time before she was killed, and also it is semi-alluded to that she possibly knew her killer, because the car that may or may not have been waiting outside of this apartment for her could possibly be her killer. Her death initially was listed as suspicious, but it has since been changed to homicide. Lineda Oliveira was found in Rutland, Mass. on September 4th of 2007. She was 34 years old from Puerto Rico who had moved to the United States when she was younger. And she was known to be an extremely genuine and generous person. She was extremely positive. She was known to have such positive thoughts when it came to her addiction that she tried so hard to kick. So hard. Unfortunately, for herself, for her family, and for her children, she would be last seen in January of 2007. And I don't want anybody to get upset by this. Her, she wasn't reported missing until May of 2007. So her family believed that she was in a detox program that she had checked into. And, but realistically, she hadn't been there in months. And this... So, due to strict rules when it comes to detox centers and early in-treatment programs, you're not allowed to have outside contact. And this is so you, can, you don't have corruption during your first 28 days of your program. It sounds very strange to those who don't have any background when it comes to this stuff, but when you're in your first 28 days, it's the first crucial days of your sobriety. And within that first 28 days... Contact with the outside world can make or break your sobriety. So don't get upset with things like this when people go missing for a certain amount of time and their family doesn't report them missing. Her family couldn't contact her due to rules due to a detox treatment center. There was no way for her family to truly know whether or not she was still there. And unfortunately so, on September 3rd of 2007, a hunter in Rutland, Mass., he, so he was there inspecting a tree blind that he wanted to make sure was all set for his upcoming, upcoming hunting season. And this is when he spotted a set of remains. This set of remains would be about 200 yards from Route 122 near the state park in Rutland, Mass. So after finding these remains, he would contact the local police. But because it was a densely wooded area, it was hard to retrieve her remains the day after the initial discovery. So it would be a few days after that they would then retrieve her remains and identify her through dental records. This would be identified as Lineda Oliveira. Her cause of death was determined to be homicide. 
and her family strongly believes that she knew who killed her. So this thought was heavily presented by one relative. And this same relative let investigators know that Lineda would call this person in particular with a license plate number of a car that she was getting into if she felt uneasy. And the last car she got into, unfortunately, she would never get a phone call about it. And if Lineda got into that car of her killer and then called her relative, maybe we would have the killer, but we don't know. So a basic summation of both of these cases is that it's entirely possible and plausible for both of these cases that could have been committed by the same person. Wasn't Alex Sensi? He would have been 19 at the time of the New Bedford Highway killings. Is it kind of young? Yes, but entirely plausible. It's entirely plausible because when he was arrested in 2007, like I mentioned, he was 38 years old. Is it young? Yes. So at times, I want you to know there is maturity and knowledge that comes with age, hence why these victims were scattered. In the profile of this person, they're in an outdoor they're an outdoorsy person. If the bodies are being put in heavily wooded areas that are not easily trekkable, somebody with knowledge of these areas, somebody with an outdoorsy background that knows how to get how to get around would be able to put them there. So do you think there's other bodies in other places that are heavily wooded? like the ones where Betsy and Carmen were found and where Lenata was found. Do you think it's plausible that there's other bodies found uh, that could be found in these areas? That the other two women that are still missing from the original case, the New Bedford ki Highway Killer case, do you think these bodies are in areas like this? Because we still haven't found them. They're not as readily found near the highway, near water, like the other ones are, like these ones are. It's no lie, in fact, that all of these victims are similar, especially with our second set of, of people. All of them, all, of, all 16 of these victims are mothers, worked in prostitution, drug use, in and around Worcester and in the New Bedford area. All of our victims from our second set, all five, are petite Hispanic women. They were all found in wooded areas near water. The New Bedford Highway killing, they're all found near the highway, kind of near some wooded area. So is it just Alex Sensi's, or is it just the killer's kind of like buildup that their MO is changing? They've now changed into, I need to dump these people in a heavily wooded area. What do you think? Let me know. It is possible that it could be Daniel Tavares Jr. It is possible that it could have been Kenneth Pont. It is possible it could have been any, any of the previous suspects that I mentioned. But in my mind, something feels right about thinking it's Alex Sensi. Do we know definitively? No. Only those that are actively investigating this case would know. Only those that have active or can actively look at all the evidence that has been gathered in both of these cases to see a correlation. Maybe, maybe this video, maybe whoever's listening to this or watching this can also help put two and two together. Maybe if you're a cop, if you're, if you're an investigator working on this case and you see, and you see this video, look at both of these cases under a microscope. Look at the similarities. Look at the timelines. What do you think? Let me know in comments down below. I would love to know. And that, my friends, is the two cases of the Maine South Woodsman case and the New Bedford Highway Killer 